from the Big Bang to the darkest of matters. Get ready to have your brains filled up because it's time for the Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week, we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekoverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. Hi, everybody. <laughs> our guest this week is Ethan Siegel. Hey, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Ethan is Portland's favorite astrophysicist and renowned scientist, science communicator. His blog, Starts With a Bang, has attracted tens of millions of hits since he began in 2008 and is now featured on online at Forbes.com. His work has been featured everywhere from NASA to ESPN to the Wall Street Journal. His first two books, Technology, about the real-life science of Star Trek, and Beyond the Galaxy, about the cosmic story of how we discovered the universe, are available everywhere books are sold. Everywhere books are sold. Hey, Mike, are they sold on Uranus? Uh, let me check. Let me see. Oh, see? Yeah. <laughs> Mike's wearing his birthday shirt. <laughs> Got him that awesome. shirt for his birthday this year. And uh, it, was, it was sort of a gag, but a real shirt. You know, I'd, I'd wear it too. So, Ethan, welcome back. Ethan's been on, I think, two times. I think it's, it's your third time. It's your third time, oh, right? Oh, yeah. This is yeah. It, this is my third time. This is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to talk with you always. And uh, as always, whoever you have around is always fun. Mike, good to see you again. Um, good to see you. And, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is so exciting. You know, I think you guys are just the perfect mix of science, science fiction, and fantasy that I could ask for. Oh, fantastic. Good, good. And we try to good, be a little... We have nothing left to give. <laughs> we try to be a little funny, a little, you know, uh, we like to bring science, but we also like to uh, keep it really accessible for everybody, uh, which is, you know, it, it's really good way to outreach to people, you know, because they're, when you start doing the, mur, 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 you know, people get, they get lost. And Ethan, you are a perfect guest for that because you blend that so well. You, you well, are. if you're not excited about it, what are you even in this business for, right? Yeah, if you can't funny. say, hey, I found this thing, I'm stoked about it, I want to get you fired up about it, like what other way is there to do it? Yeah, no doubt. Absolutely. Right. And I don't understand how anyone couldn't be excited about science. I mean, if if you're not excited about it, it means you don't understand it. And then you should just understand it more and you'll get excited about it because there's so much cool. I mean, I've seen... You know, I, so we're going to have a talk. One of the things we're going to talk about at Balticon, one of the shows, is about the merits of hard science fiction. And we're going to use The Expanse as the example of how hard science fiction can be super entertaining and, and, and so interesting and good storytelling and how that real science actually drives that story to be better. Um, so I think, you know, anyone who is who, who really gets into the science of things, they will realize that, you know, oh, my God, this is so cool. So how, the, how the heck did I not know this? You know, I think there is such a good opportunity to have good storytelling with solid science behind it. Like that, that really enhances a story to me. Like I, I love fantasy, and there are some there are some great shows that are that are soft science fiction um, that that really focus more on the fiction. But the last uh, sci-fi book I read was uh, the Ken Liu translation of uh, the Three Body Problem. Hmm. which is um, just a fantastic sci-fi story about this tri-solaran civilization where where it appears that they have three sons and they can't quite make it to the next stage in their civilization because they keep getting wiped out by the chaotic orbits that take them to a day where they all get burned to a crisp. <laughs> and... Um, and this is, I think, just a great look at the fact that, hey, you know what? Yeah, the sun is a single star with planets orbiting it. But the overwhelming, like, I would say about half of the stars are in binary or trinary or quaternary systems. Like, the sun is about 50% of the stars out there are like ours. And the other 50% are in multi-star systems and orbits are less stable there and chaotic things can happen. And let's incorporate that into the story. Right. And he, he does it brilliantly. So I, I agree. I think that when you add an element of good science into your sci-fi story, you enhance the story. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So before we before we dive into all the subject, I had a question that came up at work 
And it's something that, that I, I kind of, I sort of read and I sort of like kind of glommed onto myself, you know, kind of thought ahead on it. Uh, and I, and I want, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm about to talk to one of the smartest guys I know, at least in the physics world, you know, um, and I just want to make sure that I'm thinking this right. And if not, you'll tell me. Um, so we were talking about, you know, the, like, uh, the, the, the existence of, of everything possibly being say a matrix type, you know, uh, matrix type setup, you know, cause there's, there's all kinds of theories on where we came from and, and, and how we exist and everything. And, um, and one of the things that I thought kind of supports that theory just a tiny bit or maybe a lot, I don't know. Um, it seems to me that every that, that we are actually digital. We're not analog, right? Because if if everything that you do, like every movement you make, or or every light wave, or everything that exists in our in our universe, eventually boils down to digital, right? Because it it has quantum states, right? That's as small as you so, can get. So so this is an interesting thing to think about, right? Like, are we analog or are we digital? Well, we're we're kind of digital but we're a little bit more than that too because okay. what i mean by that is when you think of digital you think of zero or one right, right. you're either yeah. in the zero state or the one state in our universe if you take anything that's a quantum particle it's zero and one superimposed on each other if you have a discrete degree of freedom. So okay. what that means is this is like, this is not something where, oh, I wrote down zero here and it's zero. It's like, no, this is this is a superposition of zero and one. It's not a bit. It's a quantum bit or a qubit. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah, that's different. All right. Yeah. That's so so right, that's that's an that. extra <laughs> an extra layer on top of things oh that God. that comes about with our quantum universe because um this was actually a um there was a uh john wheeler put forth uh an idea that the universe behaved like this and he called it it from bit and it was uh it was sort of an outgrowth of things that people were experimenting with like conway's game of life which was a deterministic thing but he quickly realized you know what we have a quantum universe. You can't do these classical calculations where you have a deterministic system to arrive at a universe that's like ours. You have to put quantum bits in there instead. Mm. And so it's the hope that if we want to create a simulation of a universe that's actually like our own, it will have to be built off of a quantum computer, not a classical computer. Nice. Okay. Are we, cool, cool. Are we anywhere close to... Uh, figuring out or even devising a quantum math i don't understand that question <laughs> uh, when you say Whoa! are we close to devising a quantum math yeah, yeah, like like a quantum math like a mathematics that would work on a quantum level like that like isn't going to use any of the number base systems we have I don't know. I'm just. Uh, I mean, I'm for me, that's what that's what the original like wave mechanics is. Is that you know the Schrödinger equation is the mathematics behind non-relativistic quantum mechanics, and quantum field theory okay. is the math behind yeah. you know relativistic quantum mechanics. And so for me, when you say what's the math behind quantum mechanics, I think well we already know that we can calculate pretty much anything we want in quantum physics to you know a reasonable accuracy using the techniques we already have and that's based on math that was known you know for quite a long time i think what you might be getting at is if we do like computer coding and you want to store some information that's something that you do using you know standard mathematical expressions are you asking if there are different rules for quantum mechanics and if we can just simply program those rules into a computer to do like a, you know, instead of having like a truly random number generator, can we have a pseudo random number generator? Are you asking, can we do that for quantum mechanics? Can we just have like, yeah, let's just put a layer of quantum on top of like oh, my normal math. I would never use the quantum blanket, I swear. But <laughs> what, what I was thinking was when you were talking about the superposition, I didn't know if that can be, I don't want to say quantified. So uh, <laughs> if that could be harnessed in, in modern math because it's like a constant, seems seemingly like a constant variable, which I know we have constant variables, 
but if they're if uh, we got quantum mechanics, know. man, it takes care of it. it so, quantum so, field so theory. If you want a little bit explanation of the math, uh, we write down the wave function right in quantum mechanics and you say okay well physically what is the wave function and i'm like come on that's like asking me what's what's the physical part of a complex number um because right. you say like no i don't i don't i don't get that what we do is we say okay i'm going to solve for all this stuff i get my answer and it's this bam complex expression that doesn't tell you everything you need the real part of this complex number. So we have a technique that we use in quantum physics to extract the real observable out of it. And that's that's something that if you programmed your computer intelligently enough, you can say, okay, we're going to calculate the underlying math, and that's not directly tied to observables. And now we're going to apply what we know about the universe to that math to extract the, ex the observable part. That's what we can do. We can already do that. We, it requires a different set of programming than like the classical universe requires, but that's not something where we would have to invent new math to do it. We already have the physics to describe that. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm pretty much already confused by the math of the physical universe we're already well, in. I'm, I'm already pretty much, that's a quandary to me. Well, so. let, me, Mike, let, me I... let me, let me put this in perspective for you, right? <laughs> if I, if I give you a, uh, if I give you like a universe and there's two things in it and one of them is a sun and one of them is a planet and you say, okay, this is simple. I bet you, I know what's going to happen. This planet's going to go around this sun for like, 10 to the 27 years before it finally like emits enough gravitational radiation that it spirals in and boom. Cause I heard about LIGO and I know that that happens. So, <laughs> you know, that's probably what's going to happen. And you'd be pretty right, but you'd have to give me something in order to make this happen. You'd have to give me for your planet. You'd have to tell me where it starts, what its position is. And you'd have to tell me how it starts moving. You'd have to tell me what its momentum is, its speed and its direction. If you gave me that, you could say, okay, now I can calculate this in relativity forever and ever arbitrarily far into the future. And I'll say, yeah, except there's this little problem, right? In quantum mechanics, there's this inherent uncertainty between position and momentum and knowing both of them exactly at any moment in time is not possible. You can only know position and momentum to some intrinsic level of certainty and below that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle ruins you from knowing it any better. <laughs> Already that ruined. <laughs> tiny little bit of uncertainty is going to propagate forward in time. So if you say, oh, I knew position and momentum just to within an accuracy of Planck's constant, yeah, that's great. But that little change in initial conditions will mean in a thousand years, in a million years, in a quadrillion years, however far you want to go, now you're going to have some significant uncertainty in your position of this planet. And that that is a limit of quantum physics that we can only deal with probabilistically. We can't deal with that in a deterministic way. And when most people say, I want a computer simulation of this, that's what they're thinking of is like, OK, I put it in and then Mm -hmm. Two million time steps in the future, I know where it's going to be at the end. And I can't tell you that with quantum physics. I can only give you a probability distribution of where it'll be. There you go, Mike. Uh, Chew on that. So, Ethan, I, I, I've been dying to talk to somebody about Star Trek Discovery, a fan, because I've watched I the series. I've watched the whole first season, yeah. and I have reviewed every episode online for Forbes. So okay. if you if you want to talk about anything, I don't know whether you've gotten spoilers from me or not, but no, uh, I'm, I'm going to lay them all out here. I've seen the show, and I don't want to give any spoilers to the effect of what actually happens like important character development in this in the series 
but I'm okay talking about like technology and things that ha- like those kind of things. Uh, and if okay. anybody's watching and you haven't seen Discovery yet, you know you're not the biggest Star Trek fan because you would have seen it by now. So I it's f- it's fair game. It's been long enough. We can have spoilers. So if you really don't want to hear this, uh, give me give us about five to ten minutes. But we're not going to go into any like story plot reveals. I want to talk about the technology, some of this technology, and I want to get Ethan's opinion on it. So. There's this spore drive, uh, mycelial network. Now, that's right. When I first read about this, before I watched the series, I was kind of like, "Ah, oh, no, I can't watch this. This is going to be so dumb, right?" But then I thought, I thought, you know what? I haven't seen it. Let me give them a chance. And they're probably stepping into this territory of, well, who knows, right? We haven't discovered it. That doesn't mean it can exist i guess and there's a lot of other star trek magic that they pull so let me give it a chance and i'm going to say right up front before we go any further i liked discovery i did i really enjoyed it you know i had a few issues here and there with it but no more than any other series no more than any other star trek series uh i thought it was pretty good i actually really liked the series a lot uh so Jonathan anyway. reinhardt not a fan <laughs> not a fan okay that's fine um so so uh ethan but we're not going to talk about the series like like you know, the story and stuff. I just want to talk about like the technology and such. So spore drive, Ethan, what do you think? What are your thoughts on that? So I, I'll tell you when the spore drive first appeared, I was very critical of it. I was like, this is just an obvious plot device. Um, and you know, this is, if you want an instantaneous jump, like uh, this is really a hokey way to make it happen. (laughs) Um, and then I started thinking, you know, what is it? Why Why is it that I feel that way? What do I feel is very hokey about this? And I realized that it isn't the notion that you could have some sort of organism or some sort of entanglement that was spread throughout the galaxy where where things were entangled with each other. And so information could maybe be, you know, teleported or or a quantum state could appear in one place and be known in a different place right that's that's sort of the same technology behind how the transporter works Mm -hmm. and so if you're saying well just apply that level of technology to a starship i think that's fine the part that i had a hard time with is why would you pick a fungal network why would you pick mycelium why would you pick a type of organism that took millions of years to appear, sorry, billions of years to appear on Earth. Right. And somehow it's spread throughout the whole galaxy. It's ubiquitous and it's all entangled with itself, even though we know that there are way more primitive forms of life that likely could actually be spread throughout the galaxy. That would be like saying, okay, um, there's a big network of proboscis monkeys and they're just spread throughout the galaxy. <laughs> been so but cool. don't worry, all the evolution that happened to lead up to the proboscis monkeys, that's not anywhere. That's right. not everywhere. It's just the proboscis monkeys <laughs> uh, eating leaves everywhere they go all throughout, all throughout the galaxy. I'm like, no. Couldn't you have just picked like a bacterium or an algae or a Arche- something Archaea. simple that you know should be there? Right. Why why do you have to go crazy? And the answer is you have to go crazy because there's a real life dude named Paul Stamets. Um, but I don't want to spoil the plot. So okay. <laughs> um, Yeah. It, and once again, once once I just said, you know what, I, it's star it's some of their Star Trek magic, whatever, it's fine. It's it's a it's a plot driving device. And I rode the story with that, and it, and I was like, ah, whatever, it's fine. You know, I just, some things you just gotta let go. Um, and that that well, was that was the one. That's a huge thing too. I think when you when I look at Star Trek, and and this has always been when I look at technology in a sci-fi series, I never look at it as did you get all the science exactly right in how you would build this thing. Of course you didn't, especially if you're imagining a future technology. You're not the scientist developing this new technology. You're a writer coming Mm -hmm. up with, how can I conceive that this would be possible? So as a scientist, when I look at that, I don't look at, did you get it exactly right the way you predicted it? Is that the way it would actually happen? I look at this thing that you want to make happen. 
would it be possible in the laws of nature that we have to make this happen, to create a universe or a version of our universe where this sort of thing happened? And if that is possible, or even if that isn't possible, what would it take to be different to make that possible? Like warp drive uh, would not be possible today with all the particles and fields and interactions that we know of. But if there's some form of negative mass or negative energy that does exist in the universe, then it becomes possible. Right. So I think one of the real fascinating things to do on that front is, you know what, we've never measured which direction antimatter falls in a gravitational field. Normal matter falls okay. down at 9.8 meters per second squared here on Earth. Right. Does antimatter also fall down at 9.8 meters per second squared? We expect it to, and if it does, then antimatter behaves like we expect. But if it falls up, we haven't measured it, who says it can't? If it does, all of a sudden, warp drive is possible, artificial gravity is possible, inertial dampeners are really? possible. Shouldn't we test that? Well, we are. We're working on that. But, but you got to get enough antimatter to do that, right? And we we just can't see that. We can't make enough antimatter to actually make like an antimatter, like a big antimatter particle, right? We can make... I mean, I think if you added up all the antimatter we've ever made on Earth, it comes out to like a microgram. But we know That's how more than to I do thought. it. That's not bad, huh? Yeah, Most of it's something. made at high energy particle accelerators. Right. If we took something like if we went close to the sun or if we took cosmic rays that struck the Earth's atmosphere, we have ways that we could gather or create large amounts of antimatter because there's all sorts of energy just going to waste mm -hmm. out there in the universe. And Every time I take a proton and a proton and collide them, protons are everywhere. Right. If it's at a high enough energy, there's a chance that from two protons, I will wind up with three protons and one antiproton. Oh. The universe spontaneously makes matter and antimatter pairs out of pure energy via Einstein's equals mc squared. So yeah. if you want your antimatter, Take advantage of the fact that the universe makes it on its own. Just do it that way. That's that's cool. Yeah, I was, you know, when when they fired up, they were firing up the the LHC, and they were talking about, oh, they're gonna destroy the universe. It's like, no, no, particles smash into each other at that speed all the time in the universe. It happens constantly throughout the universe. It's not, you know, it, this is not something. We're not doing something new. So let me tell you, we measure energies in particle physics in units of electron volts. When you mm -hmm. like, that's it. We call it an EV. Right. And sometimes people talk about it as like MEV for mega electron volts, GEV for giga electron volts. It's like computers, but for energy. Well, when we came out, when they came out with the LHC, this was going to be the most energetic machine we've ever built. It's going to achieve energies in collisions of 14 TeV, where T is tera electron volts. Right. That's that's about that's about. I'm just going to round off to order of magnitude. That's collisions of approximately 10 to the 13 electron volts. From cosmic rays, those are just particles that zip through space and collide with the Earth occasionally. We get up to 10 to the 20 electron volts from that. And the only reason we think we don't get higher energies than that is because the universe is full of stuff and any higher energy stuff gets goes through like breaking radiation. It's called Bremsstrahlung radiation, where it actually loses energy before it reaches us. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, there's a special cutoff. It's known as the GZK cutoff. So but anyway, my point is we've had collisions 10 million times the energy of what they achieve at the LHC <laughs> for billions of years right. all throughout the whole universe, including right. here on Earth. Right. And the universe is still here. Yeah, so there good. are people who are worried about what's going to happen at the LHC. And this, to me, is just people not having enough real shit to go worry about. Like, I've got to go make it up. <laughs> got to make shit I gotta up. i got to go make it up. The LHC is going to destroy the world. Right. Doomsday is coming on June 28th. An asteroid's going to hit the Earth. Where's right. Nibiru? Like, right. this is all, like... <laughs> 
Oh, just worry need, about real shit, can you? I need to make up my. Uh, I've been wanting to make up one of these. I haven't done it in a long. I haven't done it, and I want to do it. I've been wanting to do it for a long time, and it's my apocalypse survival card. And every time one of these nutcases talk about, oh, the apocalypse, you know, the Earth's gonna end on July twenty first. Every time I survive it, I want to punch that thing and go survived another one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get like a free That's coffee a or something. I've I've never heard anyone offer with such certainty and here are the consequences I should suffer if I'm wrong. Exactly. If you get me a doomsday prognosticator who's willing to accept consequences for their wrongness when their prophecy doesn't come true, I would be extremely interested to watch that happen. Yeah, I want him to, like, I'll tell you what, you sign your house over to me on July 22nd, because, the you know, the 21st, it's going to, the world's going to end. What do you care? You're not, you're so sure that it's going to end, you just give me your house. You know, I'll take care of it for you. And you know what? Silly me. Silly me thinking I'm still going to be here to collect on that, you know? <laughs> All right, so, so yeah. let's, um... All right, so let's get into. So you, you wrote, you've, you've written a book called Technology. I think we talked about it last time, but I just want to touch on it real quick again. Um, so you talked about warp drive, and I didn't. Oh, here, let me let me put that on there. There you go. Hold that up again. Oh yeah, it's a pretty. This book. This is a good book. Jeez, Look how beautiful. pretty it is inside. As I open to random pages, we got the license rights from Star Trek and CBS. Sweet, nice. And so beautifully, beautifully illustrated book. So now, so you go into the, the technology of Star Trek. Um, so, so I'm wondering. You were just saying warp drive. So, so warp drive is a, it, it, with if if say for example antimatter. What would we need up today? Out of out of a gravity oh. well, then that would work. Is there is the, so that I, I had no idea that would work. So, is there any other way? Let's say that isn't it. Is there any other way? Because I know NASA was talking about testing some kind of warp drive. Is that real? I mean, is that is that a thing? When you say NASA was talking about testing some type yeah. of warp drive, yeah. um, that's NASA has devoted funds to test prototypes for ideas that may someday lead to Got warp drive. Right. Um, if you look at the guy's name is Sonny White. And he's a good engineer and a very crazy person when it comes to when he talks about theoretical physics. Um, right. Not to pull any punches here, but uh, if he didn't work for NASA, um, no one would know who he is. He would be on some like Time Cube internet forum. It okay. would be um, like his physics stuff is just super wrong. Uh, okay. But but that's fine because what's interesting is um, the whole motivation for warp drive from a physics point of view, you know, we know how general relativity works. And the thing is with general relativity, there are a whole slew of solutions that it admits. That doesn't mean the universe obeys all of them. They're mathematical solutions. If I said to you, Peter, Peter, what's the square root of four? You'd tell me it's two. And I say, oh, two, huh? Are you sure? And you'd go, oh, crap. He's oh, trying crap. to trick Ethan's me. Ethan's tricking me. Right. <laughs> Hashtag new math. I am trying to trick you because it could be two, but it could be negative two. Oh, yeah. And, right. and which one is it? Right. In the physical universe, you only have one solution that's physically correct. But you don't know if it's positive two or negative two just from the math. You have to compare it to your actual universe to get that right answer. So for general relativity, we had assumed that there would be a solution for warp drive, but we didn't know what it looked like until the mid-1990s when theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubierre wrote down a solution. He reverse engineered it. And what he found was, hey, there's this big problem in special relativity. If I want to go to, let's say, the TRAPPIST-1 system, right? Real interesting star, 40 light years away. It's got seven Earth-sized planets around it. Some of them are in the habitable zone. 
pretty good looking stuff. So you say, okay, special relativity, I'm gonna accelerate real close to the speed of light. Maybe I'll make the 40 light year journey because of length contraction in only six months. I'll do my business there, I'll turn around, I'll come back. I've only aged a year, but I come back and everyone else has aged 81 years because of how time dilation works in relativity. This is not good. That's not what you want with your warp drive. You right. want to go away for a year, come back, and everyone else has aged a year. So right. how can you do that? And he said, hey, I've got a solution. You build a warp bubble around what you want to transport. And in front of you, this bubble will compress the space in front of you. So when you move through it, you're moving through this compressed space, you're going, you're not going faster than light through space. You're going close to the speed of light through compressed space. And so effectively, you travel a greater distance than special relativity would let you. And the way you make up for that is you rarefy or expand the opposite of compression, the space behind you. So turn in the direction you want, take your six month journey back on earth. Everyone's age six months. Stop. Every space goes back to normal. Do your stuff on the planet. Turn around, compress the space in front of you, rarify it behind you, come back. And now you've aged a year back on earth. They've aged a year. That's the warp drive you want. The extra ingredient you need to make this physical is you need the positive mass and the positive energy that we know and love and use, but you also need some sort of negative mass or negative energy to make space do what you want. Hmm. I don't know of another solution to it, but that's the one solution that I can say, hey, if this stuff exists, then this will be real. So what we would need to discover this negative energy, right? We'd need, we'd need to be able to do that. Like how, how would we, I mean, you're saying compress space and expand space. How would, how would you do that? How is that done? So, so negative energy. So, okay. For electric charges, you have positive and negative and you don't have any problems with that. Nope. For mass, that's a gravitational charge. Mass is a gravitational charge, but we don't think of it like that because it's always positive. It's right. always a positive charge. So you and I are attracted to each other. It's very weak, but right. gravitationally, we're attracted to each other, just proportional to our masses and our distances from each other. Well, if there were a negative mass, if I were made out of negative mass, um, mm -hmm. then in theory, you and I would repel each other, but me and other negative mass things, we would attract each other. Okay. It would be like the opposite of electromagnetism where like charges repel and opposite charges attract. Right. In gravitation, it would be that like charges attract and opposite charges repel. It would okay. just be like electromagnetism with the opposite sign. Hmm. So you would basically you would you would kind of generate you'd want to generate uh, gravity in front of you and anti gravity behind you is that is that what you're saying something like that or you would want so so to curve to compress space you would need both you need a combination of something to curve it and to anti curve it okay. and then behind you you would need the opposite combination of that so you need okay. both things to yeah, make both. all of this happen okay. And it's Very just cool. based on how you configure it. What I think is fascinating is if negative gravitational mass exists, you can do all sorts of awesome things with it. You can have inertial dampeners. You can build artificial gravity yeah. where you can say have a positive gravitational thing on the floor and a negative gravitational yeah. thing on the ceiling. And so you just make like a capacitor except instead of an electric field, you've got a gravitational field that pulls you down. That, and that, that way you can sense. always be on the floor of your spaceship as you travel through space. It's going to be very ubiquitous once we figure it out. So it, so, uh, so that all works oh, yeah. together. So in other words, everything – So, all right. So now I'm getting it. So in Star Trek, when you have the inertial dampers, so people – you know they can change vectors quickly and nobody gets splattered. Uh, they, they could take off really fast. No one gets smashed against the wall. Uh, they also have artificial gravity. They have anti-gravity and they have warp drive. It all, it's all really kind of stemming. They only had to discover really one technology and the rest of it's just application. 
I think so. You need, I mean, and that's usually how it works in science and technology right, is yeah. you get one big scientific breakthrough and you say, oh, wow, well, I could do this with that. Right, what else yeah. could I do? Oh, right. I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. When I went through my book, there were 28 different technologies that I profile in there. And what I found was that only four of them require additional physics in order to become real. The other 24, these are just application or engineering or technical expertise questions that we have to overcome. How do we get this much antimatter? How do we safely confine it? How do we annihilate it at the proper rate? Right. How, like everything else is like, no, like we, we can do this. We can do this today. Like right. we just need the right investment and to bring this to fruition. But a whole bunch of these technologies are on their way and they're way closer in many cases than I ever realized. There's really only a handful. The one, if I had to guess, that's the furthest off is subspace communication. And I just say that because there's no such thing as subspace as right. far as we know. We just have the regular that's, kind. That's funny because you're leading into my, my last question on, the, on, on Star Trek stuff, on Star Trek technology. Um, communication was, was the next one. And I've heard people banter around. I've heard other science fiction authors banter around the idea of using entangled particles. But I've also heard mm -hmm. from real scientists, people who, you know, like not writers, scientists say, yeah, that's not a thing. It's like, it's, it's, I get where you're going. You know, if you have, if you, if you change the, the, the spin of one particle, no matter where it is, it'll change the other, you know, the other one. It's like, well, we could communicate by, by just changing the spin and ones and zeros, right? And from my understanding, that's a, that's a big no. That's not going to work. It is a big no, and most people don't realize why. So I'm going to see if I can break it down for you in, in, in layman's terms. So imagine that we make these two entangled particles, and I've got one and you've got one, and we go super far away. And we haven't measured them. So mine's in a superposition of up and down, which means yours is in a superposition of down and up, mm -hmm. right? I know if I measure mine and it's up, I know yours is down. If right. I measure mine and it's down, then I know yours is up. I can't use that to send information. Okay. I can use it to learn information about you. And you can use it to learn information about me. But if I say, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this one be up. And then I know yours is down. Mm -mm. I can measure mine. And if it happens to be up, then I know yours is down. And if it happens to be down, I know yours is up. As soon as I take this and I say, I'm going to force mine to be up, I broke the entanglement. Gotcha. Okay. So, so yours is still going to be 50-50 up down. Right. If I force this because I don't know anything about yours. Also, if I measure mine and mine's up and I know yours is down, you don't know that yours is down until you measure it. Right. I can only find out that yours is down slower than or at the speed of light. I can't get there faster than that. Right. This was a theorem that was put forth by a team of researchers in, I think, 93 uh, where one of the co-authors was a guy named William Wooters, Wooters, W-O-O-T-E-R-S. And he, and that paper is like, that's how we know you cannot transport information faster than light. Right, right. And that's, yeah, exactly. Because because when I first heard that, I was, I thought the same thing. I was like, oh, great, we can use that for communication. And, and then I was reading somewhere and a guy's like, oh, nope, mm -mm, nope, can't do it. And I was like, okay, all right. We'll have to figure – that's where you make shit up. You just say mycelial network <laughs> or whatever it is you yeah, need to make up look, in science if fiction. If you've got a story that you want to tell and it involves inventing technology that doesn't exist, then you find a way you make the technology exist. And if you don't get it exactly right as the way it would exist in real life, well, hey – I'm always available for consultation, Star Trek Discovery writing staff. You know, right. you, yeah. want, you, you want to add a little more science into your FI? You know, well, I'll, I'll see you in Las Vegas in August. Mike, you've heard me scream this before, right? Yeah. I Every every science fiction movie or TV show needs to have a scientist, a, a scientist that they consult that knows what the hell they're talking about well, well, and just yes. go consult them and they'll tell you, hey, look. 
that's not right. That's not a thing. But, but if you were able to do this, that would be a thing. You right. know, this is what you want to do. Let me, let me help you get there. Same thing with, uh, I think they started to have role players on any kind of show like this, like uh, D&D players, yeah. game role playing. Sure. Because I always see characters do stuff in shows and I'm like, why doesn't he just do the thing he did yeah. last week? He has that skill. He has that ability. You know, right. if I was, if this is my character, I looked at my character sheet and he has this, I'm going to just use this GM. Okay. You know, and then they don't use it in this show and you're like, Oh, why not? <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think you need to have scientists on board and I think you should hire Ethan. Definitely. So yeah, go ahead and reach out Star Trek. I'll see you all in uh, July and August. I'll be at Star Trek Las Vegas this year. <laughs> Ethan, so Sans, uh, what do you call it? We were talking about the the warp drive and the um, communications and everything. But what is your in from your book? What is your favorite piece of technology? You know, it would have to be the one that surprised me the most, uh, and that would be Syntha Hall. Really? When they came out with Syntha Hall on Star Trek: The Next Generation, I was like, that would just be brilliant if you could have all the good effects of alcohol. If you could have the euphoria and the increased self-confidence and the good feelings without the dehydration and the dead brain cells and the cirrhosis of the liver and the addiction mm -hmm. and, and all the negative things that come with alcohol, how great would that be? And as a bonus, when the, when the red alert siren goes off, <laughs> if you could just be like, oh no, I need to be sober now, the Klingons are approaching, and then you are sober, wouldn't that be great? Well, they have a whole pharmacological class of drugs that they're developing that are doing exactly this. See, the whole thing when you drink alcohol is you produce these molecules that bind to receptors in your body. And there's a whole slew of receptors that they bind to. They produce the good effects that you want and the bad effects that you don't. Mm -hmm. What they can do and what they've been working on is they're saying, you know, all of these receptors that get bound to, they have different what we call subunit receptors. So you can make a subset of these molecules that you can ingest that will bind to some of them and not others. As we go down this road, you can have them bind to more and more of the good ones and fewer and fewer of the bad ones. Plus, there are competing pharmacological compounds that you can say, oh no, a red alert, you take a pill and they outcompete and kick out all the other ones that you just took and you go back to a sober state. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say practically, this is not ready for prime time because the side effects of these drugs are too great, right? You don't want to take the antidote and have a risk that you'll have a seizure. That's that's probably not desired. But, yeah. but wow, when you think of all the people who've had problems with alcoholism, with uh with liver damage, with kidney failure, with with mm -hmm. all the problems that drinking alcohol brings with it, if there were a way to enjoy the good parts of it without having to suffer the negative parts of it, that was something that I didn't realize was possible. The physics ones, I knew most of those. The biology ones, those were eye-openers for me. Cool, very cool. All right, All right Pete, well, we're running low on time. Yeah. Was there anything else we wanted to hit on before we, we switch? We do, real quick. Uh, you have a tour. You have a uh, Astro Astro Tour, Iceland Astro Tour. Tell us about that real quick. This is one of the coolest opportunities that I am so thrilled to be able to offer. So next January, uh, during the third week of January, I will be leading a trip to Iceland. Iceland is just below the Arctic Circle. So this is in January. We're going to be getting about 18, 19 hours of night, including 16 hours of total darkness. It's an all expenses inclusive trip to Iceland where we fly into Reykjavik. We take a tour all around the island of volcanoes and natural hot springs and glaciers and all these and waterfalls and all these natural wonders. And then at night, we're going to go hunting for a Rory. We're going to take in a good view of the northern skies, the constellations. They have great dark skies. Uh, auroral activity should be at a very good level in January. And one of the nights there where we'll be staying on the active volcano, um, we're actually scheduled to get a total lunar eclipse nice. that night. Oh, 
You're going to go visit the Icelandic forests? I mean, the Icelandic tree forest? <laughs> I don't know how we would miss it. I mean... <laughs> Iceland is known for not having many trees. That's why it's just... Yeah, I think I think mostly we're going to see the natural terrain there. Um, I don't yeah, know. I don't know, country. I know what that. what other things we have, but we're partnering with a tour company, uh, Colette and Mermaid Tours, and we are. There's going to be a local guide, and I'm going to be the astrophysics guide there, and so I'll be the science person. There'll be an Iceland person, and that's what we're doing. And for uh, I believe seven days, six nights, you will have just total access to me. Space is capped at, I think, 40 people. Um, oh, and we so still have intimate. a few openings left. So if you're interested, it's astrotours.co slash starts with a bang. And right. that's where you can find my my Astro Tour. And uh, next January, it should be so much fun. And you can, you can click on the link. There's, it's already in the video. So it's all down there. below the video in the notes. Bam. You can already click there. Yes, sir. So there you just, go, Mama Marsh. That's your that's going to be your trip this year. So so here's here's uh, I'll just point these out because I stole them off the off the website. Uh, it includes a boat trip in the bay outside right right Jevik. Uh, explore the geothermal fields of of Geyser and Storkukur. Uh Check out the oh huge Gulf. I'm gonna have waterfall. you do the official uh, the official <laughs> announcing of God. these <laughs> places with Icelandic names. Yeah. Wonderful. It'd be fun, especially if you put a few beers in me. Uh, hang They'll around the pronounce cool it better. I got this one. Hang around the cool town of Vic on the southern <laughs> coast. Take a dip in the Blue Lagoon. Explore. Thing Valley Parks <laughs> Rift Valley. Uh, it sounds awesome. It really does. <laughs> you got Blue Lagoon. That was good. I got that right. Yes. Yeah. Blue Lagoon. I got right. Okay. All right. So hey, we're we're pretty much uh, we're out of time for the show. Uh, I want to do. We're gonna play a game though. Stick around. We're gonna play a game because I put a game together just for Ethan. Ooh! Uh, can't yes, wait. Sir. Yes, it, and it has to do. You are you are you're gonna like this. This, this is this is right up your alley, um, and, and there's no pressure to it. So, so don't worry about it. If you get some questions wrong, don't worry about it. Trivia, it's a trivia game, and trivia games oh. are always more deceptive. People think you know, hey, I know a lot about this subject, and you go, oh yeah, let's do some trivia, and it's like, ah, oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> so, so don't worry. If you get a few wrong, not a big deal. So anyway, let's do it. It's time for uh, it's take, I'm sorry. It's game time with the Mythwits. I'm your game master Peter Bryant, and on this episode, we're playing Bet the Geek. I have taken questions directly out of Aether Forge Aether Forge's Cube of Death RPG trivia game. We're gonna see how strong Ethan's Trek foo is. I will ask Ethan Star Trek trivia questions. Mike and I will bet on whether Ethan will get the answers correct or get them wrong. We will also hedge that bet by one, two, or three points based on how confident we are in Ethan's Trek Foo. So this is really right, a game let me between put me my and Mike. Face on. <laughs> yes. yes. There will be five questions, a total of five questions that we'll actually be betting on. Mike and I will start with ten points each. Mike will be manning the scoreboard. I uh, am, um, and I have it, sir. You're gonna have to. Oh, never mind. We're all good. Yeah. All right, and uh, we'll start with three warm-up questions to help us gauge Ethan's trekky prowess. Uh, it's now time to bet the geek. Uh, now, so Ethan, these first three questions I'm going to ask you, you could answer right away. There's Mike and I are not going to bet on these. This is just so that we can get a feel for where where you are so we can bet. And Mike, do you happen to have um, uh, paper and pencil handy by you anywhere? By uh, any chance? Can it be a pen? can be a pen. I don't care. Then, because we're yes, going to do something different this time, Mike. We're not going to call out our answers. You and I are going to write ours down. Uh Oh. So that we don't hear with each other's betting. Because usually we do that out in the open. But I think this time, I, I want to try it this way and see what we get, okay? Okay. All right. And it's All not right. that I don't trust you. This just helps us remember what I bet. You no, know, what no, we that's down. a good idea. Okay. So, so we'll do that. All right. So, Ethan, while Mike's getting that ready, let's start with our first test question. What is the name of the Klingon homeworld? The Klingon homeworld is Konos. Yes. Correct. Correct, correct, correct. That would be a... Uh, who was the Denobulan chief medical officer of Enterprise NX-01 during its his historic voyage? Now, that's the first one with uh, with Captain Arthur Archer. What, what was the name of his doctor? Do you remember? It's a tough one. Mm -mm, I'm not going to get that one. All right, that was Dr. Flox. 
Dr. Flox. Okay. Remember him now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see. I, th- I think you're going to get this one. So approximately every seven years, Vulcan males and females who are bonded to each other experience an overpowering mating drive known as. Oh, no. I should <laughs> know this one. Oh. Um... I'm going to say something gross. Flesh meld. No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> Close. Pond far. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we have an idea. We, Mike, you and okay. I have an idea where Ethan is. So, uh, so, so we're gonna play. We're gonna play Bet the Geek now. Um, so again, Ethan, don't sweat it if you don't know the answer to these. That we're not testing you. Mike and I are, are trying. We're gonna try and gauge what we think you're gonna get and what you're not gonna get. All right. So, Mike, okay. are you ready? Uh, yes. Okay. And you don't have to hold your paper up or anything like that, Mike. I'm just saying, write it down just so we don't forget. All right. So well, I, I have a scoreboard, right? I don't understand. No, you have a scoreboard here. I'm saying write it there because we're not going to I'm not going to say, hey, Mike, I bet this until after right. Ethan answers. OK, it's all right. Different. Gotcha. All right. So, Ethan, first question. And don't answer this one until Mike and I bet. As established in Star Trek TOS, which is the original series episode, let that be your last battlefield. How many Enterprise officers are necessary to initiate the self-destruct sequence? So we're looking for how many officers do you need? To initiate the self-destruct sequence. All right, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna write down my answer. About what we think, not what we yeah, right. Well, no, no, uh, what we I'm think gonna see whether Ethan's gonna get it right or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. All right, and, I and got my answer. One, two, or three. All right. Okay, Ethan, we're locked. Mike, you're locked in. I'm locked in. How many officers does it take to initiate the self-destruct sequence? It takes two. Two. Oh. Ah. I'm sorry. It takes three. Mike, what did you have? Uh, I said yes for two. I said yes for two as well. Oh, no. Yeah, it okay. takes three. It takes right, three. So now so, I got to fill in the blanks. And now I uh, yeah. so it we was... both said yes. 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 Two. Two. And then correct is a no, right? Right. That's correct. We got, we did. All right. Okay. We both lost points on that one. Okay. All right. Next one, Ethan. All right. Uh, all right. So what? That's a tough one. That, uh, I, I, would, I thought you would get that one. All right. I thought I would get it too. Hey, I said two, but my guess in my head was two. So, you know. Was it really? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Now these are not Star Trek tech questions. So that could be, that could be what's going on. All right. So what, what is the name of Starfleet's black ops division that operates separately from Starfleet intelligence? It's their, their, I don't know what you would call it. They're not their CIA, but like, like it'd be like their KGB or whatever, but they're secret. Internal affairs. They're not even really supposed to exist. Nobody knows who they are. So I'm gonna, all right, Mike, I got mine. Okay. I got mine too. Okay. So Ethan, do you, do you know uh, this should be section 31. Mike, what did you say? I said yes for two. Damn. I mean, All right, three, so Mike got... I'm sorry. No, I pat my finger. I said yes y- for three. Sorry. Yes for three. Mike, I had said no for two. All Mike right. takes the lead. Good answer, yes. Ethan. Fantastic. Uh, three. You Good should answer. bet against me when I don't know the answer, but bet with me when I do know the answer. I, Have you been paying attention <laughs> to the ship number? of discovery on star trek discovery oh, i have not it's the ncc 1031 god damn it i missed that fantastic oh so they are going to be the beginning of section 31 they're, they're going to be the ones that start section 31 which makes sense that makes total sense all right fantastic because that's that's basically what they are all right fantastic um yeah all right damn that was a good, good catch, Ethan. All right, so all right. <laughs> I totally went. Spoiler. Right. <laughs> uh, hey, you know what? The only other thing I didn't like about that was the way that ship flips around when they go through that jump. I don't. I thought that was kind of goofy. That was like a weird special effect. Oh, I like the visuals. I think I think the visuals is something I, I can't admonish them at all for that. That's really? Oh, when the ship top notch visuals. Right. OK. All right. No, I mean, I I'm... wouldn't have it do it that way. But look, you know, angular momentum is important in physics. I'll buy it. OK, why not? But sure. there is no physics in space, is there? <laughs> yes, there's nothing but physics in space, Mike. All right. So <laughs> there's, no, like, wind. there's no wind or anything to be. Why would you? <laughs> all right. So, Ethan, what? 
is the name of the genetically engineered humanoid race that served as the military arm of the Dominion. So Jonathan, this one goes out to you because this is a DS, I'll give you a hint, it's a DS9 question. These are the shock troops of the Dominion. So, I'm gonna... Mm, 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 Ethan's mm. messing me up here. Let's see. All right, I'm locked in. Yeah. Oh, what the hell. All right, I'm locked in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ethan. Who who was a military arm the, the uh, of the Dominion? I'm gonna go with the Jem Hadar. God, <laughs> that's correct, Ethan. That is a big old Mike. Mike, what did you put? Oh, uh, I well, I wasn't sure, so I said no for one, just oh, to be a, a little conservative. Man, see, I went against Ethan on this one. I said no for three. See, what, he totally what you knew it. Should be learning from this is that my next generation knowledge and my ds9 knowledge and then my voyager knowledge are probably the strongest because <laughs> those were the series i grew up on true, true. i see the Gen- was something that i came to later right and then you know the original movies were something i came to later right and you know discovery i've seen all the episodes twice okay They're, and that's that's where i'm good at if you want to bet on me Bet on me for the 90s era shows. Gotcha. And that okay. is fascinating. But more importantly, I would just like to point out that currently the score is <laughs> Pete with a scant three points and Mike with a uh, moderate, happy 10 points. 10 points. Son of a bitch. All right. So, Ethan, <laughs> Ethan all right. Here's the here's, uh, next to last question. I don't think we're going to have to do the tiebreaker, Mike. All right. Uh, what <laughs> What is the name of Jonathan Archer's pet dog? All right, don't answer. Don't answer. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, he just said don't, but I'll bet you. Uh, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to talk about this anyway. Yeah, I'll bet you that he knows that. No, not that, but, you know, whatever. Um, All right, Mike, you locked in? Yeah, uh, yes. All right, Ethan, what is Jonathan Archer's pet dog? I don't know this one. I know that he wouldn't send it through the transporter. Damn it. I remember that they were all talking about him sending the dog that using a transporter. Yeah. And he's like, I wouldn't send my dog through that thing. Right. And but you, I don't you, remember the name of the dog. But you recognize the dog, right? Little beagle, right? <laughs> it's, it's a cute dog. I have two dogs and one of them is part beagle. So right. I... I definitely, I definitely think of that. What's the name? Help me out. The name is Porthos. Porthos. Okay. Why isn't that working? Sorry oh, to Mike, let you, you down, Mike. Guy. There you go. Uh, yeah, well, you let me down too because I thought you would know it. Yes for three, Mike. <laughs> okay. I'm at zero. All right. Pete. <laughs> Zero Pete, points. Uh, bet the farm on that one. I did. I thought I'd pull ahead. All right. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> Last one. Okay. All right. What I'm just going to try and get whatever. I'm going to try and guess what you're going to bet, Peter. No, see no, if you no, can do... go over five. It, it's okay. I usually I, I usually beat Mike at this game when I play, so it, it's all right. It's all right if he wins. <laughs> Not that, I don't always win. Mike has beat me. Mike has beat me. But, all right. Just read the question. All right. All right. All righty. What renegade group was formed after a peace treaty was enacted between the United Federation of Planets and the Cardassian Union? This is a D- DS9, but also spills into Voyager. So, let's see. Hmm. Well, seeing as how there's no way I could possibly lose. <laughs> yeah, there's... There's absolutely no way you could, you could, Mike, it doesn't even matter what you put, but go ahead. You can use all your points. I sure can. All my, (laughs) all my points. (laughs) You know what? Let's just see if you go into the minus. You bet what you want. No, minus is funny. It's funny when you have minus points. All right. So Ethan, what, what is the uh, renegade group that was formed after the peace treaty that was enacted between the United Federation of Planets and the Cardassian Union? That would be the Maquis. Yay. Did you get one? I did. I got one. So, Mike, I bet yes for three. Mike, you bet yes for three. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. So, so hey, hey uh, while the camera's on, Mike, everybody, 
Uh, what, what was so the score? We've learned that mind reading is not yet a technology that's come to fruition, or uh, at no. least that's made it to the Myth Mythwit's office. No, no, <laughs> there would have to be a mind here for that, and we have not. <laughs> well, at the end of the one, two, three, four, five, what was that the fifth and final yeah. round? Yeah, uh, Pete. Uh, was managed to uh, borrow three points and uh, gain three points. Right. And I was able to finish with a scant uh, 11 points. Hey, Mike. Oh, Mike gets his winning music. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for making this moment possible. I, I want to dedicate this to our fans because we do have plural fans now. Usually I used to say I dedicate this to our fan, but right. now we have more fans. Four. <laughs> That's great. We have five That's people huge. watching right now. So no, now we have. Maybe I'll see all four of them in Iceland. No, yes. actually, so so we're getting. We we switched to Facebook Live and we get tons yes. of views now. It yeah, totally really well. picked up. It was but our. It, we found our medium. And how many of them are from Russian chatbots? No. Oh, don't. What? No, <laughs> no, 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 stop it. Stop it. <laughs> wow, we I just got trolled. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't Do they do that? Like, why would they do that? Is it Facebook? Would they do that just so that you think you're getting more views? Is that the like, I don't, you? I don't think so. I, 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 I think you're getting real views. Yeah, I, okay, think, I, I think that's the way it works. We're, we're, we're not even a blip on the Russians radar. Yeah. Yet. <laughs> yes. Yet. Yes. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> not, not until we run for president, Mike, right? Yeah. You right. didn't ask me any Walter Koenig questions, so okay. Are you a Walter Koenig fan? Big. Uh... Well, Chekhov is traditionally the Russian, you know, Star Trek character. Right, right. Wal okay. Walter Koenig was great. I mean, he's, as far as I'm concerned, like from the original series, he's someone who was introduced very late, and yet when I think of the original cast of the original series, he's always in there. Like, I always think of Chekhov as like, yeah, like he belongs on the bridge of the, of the first Enterprise. Right. Yes, with the Wessel. With the Vessel. The vessel. nuclear Wessels, yeah. Yes. Nuclear <laughs> Wessel. <laughs> no, I love Chekhov. Yeah, I always thought of him yeah. as, he. when did he come in? He came in like a, a second season or something? It might yeah, have even so. been third season. I'd have to look it up. Yeah, I would have thought that, yeah, you're right. I do see him as, when I think of Star Trek, I see him as one of the key, like, key core characters. Mm -hmm. And, oh, my yeah. God. And that's, I, and that's something that I have to bring up to everyone. I, I meet a lot of people who are down on Discovery. And, and I have to bring that up to them. I say, when you think about the first season of any Star Trek series... Right. There are a whole lot of, you know, growing pains of things finding their view. You watch that whole first season of Discovery. There are a lot. There's more than a handful of quality episodes where you watch that and you were like, that was some great science fiction. Yeah. And I will. I will put the first season of Discovery up against the first season of any other Star Trek. And I think it'll compare quite favorably. Yeah. Now, I th what they know. do in the second season and beyond, that's really going to be what defines it. Right. But I'm, I think people who have written it off already, way too early, especially given the quality of, of what the season became, especially in its second half. Oh, dude, I, I actually, you know, it, it's funny. I liked, I, I, I didn't think I would like it. I really didn't. I didn't. I was like, well, I'm going to check it out just because we do this show and, you know, I got to stay up to date on it and just stuff I'd read about it, you know, from other people talking about it. And I was like, but you know, I'm gonna give it a fair shot. I'll give it a go. In the first episode, I wasn't, I was kind of like, meh. And then I got into the second episode. I was like, that's a little better. And it just kept getting better and better. And you're right. By the, by the back half of that series, I was like, man, this is, this is really good. And I love the twist. They, the big twist, which I'm not going to reveal, the big twist about what two or three episodes before the last episode is like, oh shit! I didn't see that coming. Didn't see it coming at all. Mm -hmm. And it made a lot of things make sense when yes. that twist gets revealed. Um, but but I'll say anyone who's written that off before they see the seventh episode, that's the time loop episode. Yeah. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. Um, like you really need to give it a chance because there are some good 
good moments and stories in there that that you know if you're a star trek fan you you won't want to deprive yourself of those right yeah absolutely absolutely all right so everybody look make sure you check out trekknology i mean he held the hold hold that beautiful wonderful looking book up again that is a pretty pretty book you got it this is fantastic we got 28 different technologies in here hardcover book over 150 full color images it's it's pretty fantastic so so get in there and enjoy and see where your favorite technologies are on the path to becoming real some of them are already here and not only that but you know we have people we, we interview a lot of sci-fi authors okay and uh and, and potential sci-fi authors and people who you know they, they just love sci-fi in general and if you're writing sci-fi or you're looking to writing sci-fi holy <coughs> um you should definitely check out the book because you go into these technologies and you could definitely mine these for for writing ideas and keep your science especially if you're writing hard science and keep your science you know in line because ethan's done he's done the groundwork for you i mean you spent all those and years in school you want to know Hey, how does the tractor beam work? I tell you, those are real. If right. you want to know, like, hey, I want to transport things. Well, what can you transport? Hey, figure out, figure out what that, what actually works with that. You want to know about replicators? Well, we're we're pretty far along. I I talk about three D printing. You know that they three D printed very recently the first pizza. Yep. on the international space station in zero gravity yeah, so you nice. don't even need your artificial gravity to replicate a pizza that is awesome and they're going to be doing it with organs and and all kinds of stuff before long yeah, yeah everything's delicious in a 3d printer <laughs> the, the only the only all right and then we'll go we'll go i just, I just got to mention this to you because i said this to everybody and i just want to get your feedback don't you know like just real quick so i watched sci-fi where they can do all this amazing incredible stuff right and they're still putting like cybernetic hands and stuff on people and it makes me nuts that's the one thing that really gets in my crawl because i'm like we can already almost grow limbs we can we're almost there right we're like this freaking close to doing it and you want to tell me that you can go into warp you know 200 years in the future and you're not just regrowing limbs like ah no sweat we'll regrow we'll regrow one you know but why would you I mean, I understand not wanting to cut your limbs off if you have healthy <laughs> limbs to replace them. But if you said, hey, you could have like a human arm or you could have this super robot arm that can do like five billion things that your real arm can't do. Oh, man, who doesn't want to be an augment? I oh, want to be an augment. augment. Yeah, yeah I, I guess. So, so Ethan's firmly in the flesh is weak camp. Which, which I like. That's cyberpunk, man. I love it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> the only thing I'm against that, and I talk about this in the book too, is I am worried about hackers. If we uh, can't ooh. keep our passwords safe, if we can't keep our credit card data safe, how are we going to keep ooh. our vision safe right. when we're Jordy LaForge? How right. are we going to keep our you know, limbs safe when we're, you know, I wish Stephen Hawking's robotic exoskeleton. I right. wish, I wish we had all these things, but I also don't want them hacked into. I don't want someone hacking into my mind and feeding me false information about the world around me. Right. Yeah. You wouldn't want them, you know, like hijacking Stephen Hawking's. Well, how'd they get to him? Hawking, not Hawking's, Hawking, Stephen Hawking. It, it, and it would be like, well, they didn't. They just they just hacked his wheelchair and rolled him into the back of a van. I'd be like, oh, no, no, not Stephen. You know, rest in peace, Stephen. We missed, oh, it's a shame. He, he was definitely a force for good, for knowledge, and for humor in this world. Yeah, Did you ever good. have a chance to meet him? I never had a chance okay. to meet him in person. Never in person. But uh, good thing he was here. He did, he did a lot for us. and, and totally I Skyped with him once, but it was just a photo. I didn't oh, even okay. realize. I'm oh, just that's... kidding. That was oh. a bad joke. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks, Ethan, for coming on. Uh, let me, you know what? Let me, uh, let me do this real quick. Let me, I know I have them in the, in the links and we talked about them before, but uh, go to Forbes.com. Uh, starts with a bang. It's forward slash sites forward slash starts with a bang. Um, check out Ethan's got a Patreon. Go back his Patreon. Support all the good stuff he does. It starts with a bang. 
uh, Patreon forward slash starts with a bang. Um, he has SoundCloud, so you have your own podcast thing going on. Uh, and that's it's it's Ethan dash Siegel dash seventeen two zero seven three four six zero. But I bet if you just search Ethan Siegel, it'll come up. Yeah, yeah. You don't get to pick your <laughs> URL on right. SoundCloud. Right, right. Uh, it, and if you if you're an iTunes person, uh, the Start to the Bang podcast is up on iTunes as well. Right, or, or your favorite out. podcatcher, right? Any anywhere, you just get into your podcatcher and search for that. Um, and Twitter, you're at Start to the Bang. I'm at Start to uh, the Bang on Twitter. I'm Start to the Bang on Facebook. I run the right. Facebook page. Um, I'm on Tumblr. Starts with a Bang, and uh, I'm Ethan Siegel on Google Plus. If anyone still uses that, some you know it has a lot of activity. Yeah. Um, and then make sure also to check out astrotours.co forward slash Iceland 2019. And that will, that will take you right to Ethan's event that he's, that he's hosting or that you're starring in or, or I don't know, is what's the title? What are you doing? Are you, cause you're not running it. You're, uh, I would say I'm leading it, leading so it. Okay. Very good. I'm, right. I'm leading the experience. All right, fantastic. All right, and if you can go, you should go. It sounds like, oh, I can't afford it, but man, it sounds really awesome. Um, all right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Let's do the, let's do the closer. All right, you've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions. Not too many questions. I think we blew their minds out this week. Uh, or just yeah, banter with the other was- myth. Mythfits. Everyone was in quiet contemplation. <laughs> they were. No, there was a lot of people watching. They were just sitting there quietly going, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, if you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or YouTube. Find us on Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits. Check out Mythwits.com. And hey, check this out, Mike. Aetherforge.com. That's A-E-T-H-E-R-F-O-R-G-E for more cool stuff. I just changed my website over. I changed my, my I'm rebranding. Uh, if you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher, or you can listen at mythwits.podbean.com. Uh, do like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread Mythwits love over the entire planet, or the universe as it is. This episode would be good for that. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out tsrpn.com for more cool shows. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it. Don't sell it and don't feed it to Tribbles. Thanks everyone for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? They just call me the Quantum Kafis baby. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Help me. <laughs> All right. And we are.